So hello everybody, uh, welcome to this uh, new uh, podcast. So we're going to call it robustly beneficial, at least uh, for now. Um, so what we're going to do is to have a series of, of podcasts uh, every week or so, where we discuss uh, papers uh, that are relevant uh, to this about uh, AI safety in general, like uh, the safety of algorithms, of beneficial algorithms, uh, ethics of, of AI and so on. And I'm uh, with uh, Louis, so can you, well, maybe you can just present yourself uh, quickly. All right, so um, I'm Louis, I'm a PhD student here at EPFL, and uh, I have been organizing since uh, six months the AXFT reading group that we have here. And uh, every week we meet, uh, read papers and related to AXFT and discuss it. Yeah, and uh, the basic idea here is that we're going to discuss the paper we uh, discussed yesterday, so we are already prepared, uh, we should be. Yes. Um, and just to present myself for those who don't know me, uh, so I, I run a YouTube channel, so I have a uh, called Science for All uh, in French, where I do a lot of science uh, popularization and in particular uh, things of, around algorithms and artificial intelligence and Bayesianism. And I also work at EPFL as a science communicator, but uh, I also do a, a bit of research re related to AI safety. And the paper we're going to be discussing today, uh, actually I don't remember the name, but it's by uh, Diakopoulos. Yeah, it was a uh, algorithmic accountability and uh, oh, there was a subtitle, something about black boxes. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, we put uh, everything in the description and uh, sorry about this. Uh, we'll try to be more prepared in the future. <laughs> um, so that was a, like, a, a very interesting uh, paper, which is not from someone who's doing, uh, like, I think he's a journalist by training or something like this. I don't know, but clearly he, he was not someone that makes the makes AI algorithms. Yeah. But he really studied it, and uh, in the papers, it sounds like he really knows about it, even though yeah. he's not someone doing it. Yeah. So, so when we discussed yesterday, you said that you actually did not enjoy the first part of the paper, like, like there was an introduction, and then there was a section. Yeah, I found I found the first part less useful to th things in terms of AI safety. But still, the uh, one thing that was very useful is this uh, question, which I think is not asked often enough, which is um, given an an AI system, what are the cons consequences of this algorithm? Yeah. And uh, usually, uh, for example, if you think of a, a recommended system the designer, the engineer building this recommended system would just say this is uh, up maximizing the likelihood that someone would click on the next video or continue scrolling the Facebook feed and uh, and it stops here. It doesn't uh, ask more questions about the consequences and um, the way that the algorithms are discussed in the paper, they, they try to understand the consequences of uh, algorithms beyond this, for example. Uh, in terms of uh, fairness or in terms of filtering, will there be content that no one is able to see because of uh, of the consequences of such algorithm or not? Yeah. So yeah. So so one thing we discussed a lot uh, yesterday was uh, the, the what the idea of a black box, which was like like it's very common. Like we all say we talk a lot about blocks, like neural networks being black boxes or algorithms mm -hmm. being black boxes, but it's um, like it's, it struck me when I read the paper that it's never really that clear what we mean by b black box. Um, like we usually just mean something that's we cannot understand something like this, I guess. Um, and uh, well, the paper has a more thorough definition, which I, I found very interesting. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, so the the basic definition of the the paper was that a black box is something you can only interact with through input and output. Uh, and maybe sometimes you don't even know the input, like maybe it's just the output. Um, and I think it's a useful abstraction like, uh, um, because like, when you're dealing with algorithms um, and you want to understand them, well, there are different approaches. Like uh, One of the classical approach if we design simple algorithms is to prove theorems about the algorithm. Mm -hmm. But usually to do this, you need to, to know how the algorithm is. Is what it is doing, like the different, like especially like the the code of the algorithm. Yes. Um, but now we have these algorithms that are more complex, uh, neural networks and stuff like this, 
Uh, and sometimes it may not even be the main reason why the algorithm is a black box, as discussed in the paper. Maybe it's just because, well, it's the algorithm of a company, uh, maybe the YouTube recommender system, for instance, and it's just propri proprietary. Like, uh, and uh, because of this, you cannot do anything about, you cannot know the inside of the algorithm, and you only interact with, inter interact with it through input and output. Um, and, and that was very interesting. Yeah, I also, also thought it was an interesting idea to, to have two concepts instead of simply the concept of something that we cannot understand, having the concept of uh, algorithms that are difficult to understand because, for example, they, they are huge, like a, a neural network with a billion weights, and some uh, other algorithms for which the, we don't have access to the, to the code of the algorithm. It could be a simple algorithm that we have a chance to understand or a very complex algorithm, but then uh, uh, I think it's very interesting because in the, in the world we live in today where there are algorithms deployed, uh, a lot of these algorithms are actually black, box, black boxes given this definition. And, um, and it's very interesting to, it could be studied in terms of uh, what are the theoretical limits we have to study a, a black box algorithm. Yesterday we discussed uh, the fact that uh, there are some theoretical limits if, the, if we assume a limit on the on the Kolmogorov complexity of the algorithm inside the black box, there, there are some, uh, some chances to, to try to understand this algorithm given a limited number of, uh, of query on the input and output. Yeah, so we discuss it, we did not prove it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's an interesting research yeah. direction as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess m m uh, like another thing we discussed a lot is the idea of a probing algorithm. Like, so you, you have this algorithm that you want to study and you want to, and it's important, like the, the critical changes I, I see with this is try to predict what the algorithm is going to be doing in this or that uh, situation. Um, and if you want to know this, then you, you should analyze this algorithm and to analyze this al algorithm, you, you, you can try to read it, but sometimes the algorithm, is, even if it's transparent, it's just too long. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and especially if it's a black box, you may want to interact a lot with it. And just doing it as a human is not uh, maybe very effective. Uh, it can be much more efficient using an algorithm to probe the other the, the black box algorithm, let's say. Yes. Uh, and what's interesting with the definition of uh, of the black box, uh, actually, you can like we also discuss the fact that you can have different definitions of the black box. Like uh, you can have this input output, which you, you can plug an input and see the output. That would be a not very black box, let's say. Uh, it's a weak black box or something like this. I played a lot with names mm -hmm. <laughs> yesterday. And as opposed to something that would be like a strong black box, uh, which would be a black box for which you can only observe the output. Yes. Uh, maybe you can also have something intermediary where you know the input but cannot choose it. Like there would be, I guess, a medium black box. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's interesting. And uh, some things to note about, uh, so why this kind of strong black box would exist, it's actually, uh, uh, sometimes you, an algorithm has been used in the past and is not being used anymore. So in that case, you see the, the output of this algorithm from the past, but you, don't, you, you, you cannot decide which input was given to this algorithm. Uh, other reason could simply be that uh, the, the, the company using this algorithm also keeps secret what, uh, what data they use as input. And uh, they, they tell a story in the paper, which was quite interesting. When probing such a black box algorithm, they they would find correlations between the, the age, for example, and, uh, and the output of the algorithm. But in the end, they, they, they learned later that the age was not actually part of the input. And uh, so that, makes, that, that, that shows that it can be very hard to, to infer something on a strong black box algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I guess this also leads to the idea, which I find like, as a research question very interesting, is uh, what, like, given a, of a, mo a model of a black box, like how strong of a black box it is, what is the best probing algorithms you can use? Mm -hmm. And I think the solution to this really depends on the assumption you make on how much, how black the box is. Um, and I think like you can have this research uh, direction where you're trying to design probing algorithms for this kind of black box, uh, other algorithms for this kind of black box. Um, which I, I, like, I don't know a lot about the research in this direction. Um, I, I know things about like adversarial attacks on neural networks, mm -hmm. 
uh, sometimes you can so uh, well, amusingly uh, people, a lot of people say that uh, neural networks are, are black box uh, black boxes uh, it's interesting to ask in which sense are they black boxes because in the sense we gave like in the, the definition we gave actually uh, a neural network is not a black box uh, because you can compute gradients from it mm -hmm. uh, so you can observe more than just the output yes um, and actually, many people are working on program verification. We had a PhD student yesterday uh, at the discussion who is doing like a verification of neural networks, which typically use information more than just the fact that it is a black box. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I think it's really interesting to, 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 to really understand this. And there's not probably not enough research in, in doing this. I, mean, I, I feel like it's an open research direction. Yeah, and I think also interesting answer about this would be that if probing uh, ends up being too difficult that at least we know that um, to counteract such algorithms the strategy would be actually not even trying to probe but like fight what is a uh, fight the black box itself and uh, try to discover what's the code inside yeah etc. just like for if you want to generate an adversarial example for a, for a neural network and if you have only access to input and output it can be a very difficult work but in that case, you would uh, make more efforts to actually access the code yeah. of the algorithms to solve it. So it would tell us what are the most efficient uh, strategies to, to to turn in the right direction uh, an yeah. algorithm. Yeah, there was also an interesting point about like, uh, like in terms of AI safety. So you have this algorithm. Uh, should it be transparent? Um, and uh, in a sense, like, well, the, the, like I'm definitely overall pushing for more transparency of these mm -hmm. algorithms. Uh, because I think they are difficult to design and you need help and to make sure that they don't have uh, uh, vulnerabilities, for instance. But it, like, just like for any algorithm, like if you also share the code, you also make yourself more vulnerable to attacks. And that's typically the case for neural networks, where if people can run the neural network uh, locally on, on the computers, they, they can compute the gradient, and it's much easier to do adversarial attacks. Yeah, so in that case, I'm very hesitant. I, I haven't thought enough about it. Whether yeah. I should be pushy for more transparency in algorithms or not, because there is all these uh, bad actors that if the algorithm is transparent, would somehow completely ruin the world. Like um, there was in the paper, the example of a spam filter. And uh, we are very lucky that the spam filter algorithm is not easily gamed. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, we would have mailbox full of spam. Yeah. 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 So, so I, 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 yeah. I guess another difficult thing, like I, I would agree that not everything needs necessarily to be transparent, and probably there are parts of YouTube that you don't want to make transparent. Um, I, I guess a key challenge is just also, like I'm just thinking it right now, but maybe a research challenge is to determine what are the things that should be made transparent. Like it, it's a whole question. Like, yeah. Like. And yeah. There is also a lot this uh, this question about transparency in cryptography, where they have the in cryptography. If you are not transparent, then you're not safe. Yeah, yeah because yeah, uh, uh, you want the system to be transparent and uh, people to try to attack it to prove that actually the system is is robust and uh, and works. So uh, over the long term, if we are building a robustly beneficial artificial intelligence, they will have to be transparent for sure. You, you just, say for sure, yeah. I'm nearly. For, I'm. I'm. I. I really think so. <laughs> Yeah, I would. Yeah, I, 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 well, I think that at least many parts of the code should be uh, more transparent. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so typically, in the case of the YouTube algorithm, yeah, I'm going to take the the case of YouTube algorithm a lot in this podcast because I think it's a great example. But uh, in the case of, of the YouTube algorithm, uh, one thing that I would really want to be YouTube to be much more transparent on is what is the objective function of the algorithm. Uh, at least much more. A lot, a lot more of what of parts of it. Like right now, it's like a big secret, big mystery. Like I've talked to many people from to uh, three or four people <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, from YouTube, and they always say, "Well, they maximize something called user engagement, and we cannot tell you what it is." Like, uh, and I think it's not good because the key, like the the key to robust to being robustly beneficial, uh, I think is recognized by, by a lot of people. Uh, is alignment like you want to make mm -hmm. sure the objective function of the, the algorithm is aligned with something we, we would want it to, to re optimize uh, and 
and I think it's so critical that, and it's so easy to get it wrong, that in order to be robust, more robustly beneficial, I think you really need to be transparent about the objective function. Um, yes. Yes, we also discussed the when given a black box that we are working on probing, probing this black box, uh, whether we would be able to somehow infer the the objective function of the algorithm inside the black box, and we we had no idea on uh, how to solve this uh, this problem. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and yeah, and it's also interesting because we, we talked about like, could you apply this to any algorithm or to humans, for instance? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, like much of the black box uh, theory that could be developed applies to humans in a sense. Uh, like, in, you can mostly like I can mostly interact with you only through input and output. Uh, that's not exactly true. If I had, uh, 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 if I could scan your brain, if I had a magnetic uh, resonance uh, image uh, machine, yeah. and I would be allowed to put you, uh, to force you to get into this, uh, that mm -hmm. would be one way. Your, your brain would not be a, a fully black box uh, to me. Uh, but uh, most of the time, I interact with you like a black box. I can exactly. give you input and I look at your output. Um, and also, I think that it's in, like I think another key question is like the question of trust. Like when you want to to trust that the algorithm is going to do what you think it should be doing. And uh, I, I think it's still possible to gain quite a lot of trust using this black box interaction. In practice, that's what we're doing for humans. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm somewhat quite confident that you are mostly robustly beneficial. Uh, and yeah, but I guess it also depends on, on people. Like, if the, maybe there are incentives, uh, uh, like I'm, I'm thinking, for instance, of politicians, uh, maybe they have so many incentives to, to behave in a certain way that the input output model, like, they, then they, they know they have secrets to protect. And, mm -hmm. um, and so the input output model may be like, like, they know they have to defend themselves against these probing algorithms. Um, and we also talked about like maybe black boxes in in the future, but maybe even right now are already trying to defend themselves again against uh, probing algorithms. You think today already? So I, I don't think that much uh, today. It's true that uh, they are, they are us usually if we would try to probe some uh, algorithms, we would use some uh, some bot or, or crawlers uh, that query the website a thousand times per second, and uh, yeah, definitely the most big companies, most websites, they, they have things against that. So we can see this as the, yeah. the so, some some part inside the black box defending against probing attacks. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, there, there, there's this sense, uh, uh, yeah, every captcha is, uh, <laughs> yeah. is in a You're sense right. uh, defense right. against probing algorithms. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so what's interesting is, is if, if I take again, again the example of YouTube is that there are people who designed algorithms to probing algorithms for the YouTube algorithm. Uh, so I'm thinking mostly of uh, Guillaume Chasselot, yes. uh, also uh, Joachim uh, Algayer, um, who are. It's very hard. I think it's, an, like, it's very interesting because you want to understand YouTube, and here we. Uh, we, we are in a not, not fully black box uh, model because you can still like create your own account and look at what it recommends. And if you click on a video in a sense, you, it's like querying, what are you going to, to recommend to me next? So it's a, it's a quite strong black box, it's I would a, say, because uh, we, we can create some input, like simulating a fake user playing YouTube. We can simulate some input, but we are not completely sure about uh, what about this fake user is used as input of the algorithm. So. And we can clearly see the whole output. The whole output is the yeah. recommendation. So that's why I would it, I would not say it's a weak black box, yeah. but in between weak and strong. Yeah, like. yeah it's medium black box. <laughs> uh, that's a, uh, and also like it's um, it, 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 like one of the difficulties of the YouTube algorithm is that the recommendation it's going to do next to you uh, depends actually on um, probably depends on everything that's uh, on a lot of things that are going on on the YouTube uh, ecosystem in general. Yes, exactly. Uh, for instance, it can only recommend videos that, it, that are on YouTube. <laughs> and if there's a new video uploaded, well, it can now uh, recommend Yeah, YouTube. and it will, it will also recommend a newest video that uh, it's, more sec it's more likely that someone clicks on the video from today than uh, the video from yeah. Uh, last year. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, mm. I think in this model, like, um, so like the, the conjecture I put on my wiki is that, uh, and, and you talked about, is that uh, you can learn uh, a black box by interacting with it a, a number of times that's proportional to the Kolmogorov complexity of the algorithm, right. so how complex the algorithm is. So if it's uh, one billion of lines of code, then with roughly one billion interactions, you can eventually learn what's inside. Mm -hmm. But on, that only holds in a very weak, like uh, the weak model of a black box. Where you, you, you have this algorithm and you control every time the input and all of the inputs of the algorithm. But I think if you have another input channel uh, yeah, of right, the algorithm, so then th this does not hold anymore. Other, da other source of data that adds complexity inside the black yeah. box. So in that case, that would be all the other users around yeah. YouTube that are constantly giving information, giving extra information for the algorithms to, to yeah. feed on. Yeah, yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah, so that, that, that's the difficulty of uh, analyzing <laughs> what's going on on YouTube. Uh, um, yeah, definitely. So yeah, again, in that case, that's a, that, that was part of the question of how can we uh, make these algorithms uh, robustly beneficial. And for something like YouTube, I don't think, uh, I think probing is it's very important. There is not enough done uh, yet, but I also don't think that it's the ultimate solution that would uh, that would completely help us understand the recommender system and and make YouTube make it uh, robustly beneficial. I think yeah. we should uh, look into the code, change the objective function. Uh, so, so I think it's interesting because uh, it depends on who you are, right? If you are from if you're not in YouTube and you don't have access to this, then it's a medium black box uh, algorithm, which means that. Well, the best you can do is this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to, but I guess what we're saying is that it's not sufficient. Like, uh, like it's, it's not going to get us there. Uh, and if you want to make YouTube robustly beneficial at some point, if you want, if YouTube wants to make it, to help people make it more robustly beneficial, you're going to have to make it not a black box anymore. Yeah. Um, and typically, uh, it's much less of a black box and typically access to, more insight into to the code. Uh, yeah, I, th mm -hmm. I think there's also something uh, interesting we talked about, which is um, so in the black box model, like uh, it's a lot about the interaction you have to, with this algorithm. Uh, but there's also this problem of uh, of priors. Like you can have strong priors on on a black box. Like uh, if I uh, tell you to write. Uh, an app to have a base, uh, uh, base uh, examinations. Mm -hmm. um, then, even if I don't know nothing, like a, like a purely black box, I don't know any output of the algorithm, you, any, any input of the algorithm. Well, I, because I know you <laughs> indirectly and uh, I have strong beliefs that you're going to design the app that uh, I have in mind, uh, I have a lot of expectation, like I have a strong prior on what the algorithm is actually going to be doing. Okay, but I, I don't understand in practice, uh, how do you get to learn this prior? Uh, you, you are not born with this prior about uh, the algorithm inside the black box. So, so you mean that without having uh, probed, even before starting probing the black box, you would already yeah. have a good idea of what algorithm is inside? Oh, okay, I, yeah. I remember we talked about it, yes. Yeah. That, uh, for, okay. Another example to be more clear that, uh, that makes me understand is that uh, even though we don't know what's the objective function, exactly what is the objective function of uh, uh, some recommender system, we have a very strong idea of what it is. We, we have, a, for example, we clearly know that it's not uh, counting the number of uh, clouds in the sky. We know <laughs> it's uh, most likely counting things like a number of clicks, number of uh, minutes spent on the website. Yeah number of uh, likes and shares and etc so yeah. we have a that that's that's the case where we even before probing we have a lot of information about the inside of the black box yeah yeah okay. yeah. yeah yeah i think this information is also useful like in the analysis uh, you want mm -hmm. to make just being bayesian here <laughs> <laughs> but yeah if you want to understand an algorithm this is part of it like uh, talking to the youtube engineers is an indirect way of of probing the algorithm in a sense that they have designed um, which uh, it's like I'm just thinking also about uh, another thing is that uh, um, in a sense the the YouTube algorithm is actually um, darker than we said because like we don't really observe all of its outputs uh, and sometimes we barely 
can analyze, like you can create a, well, you can prove it by having an account and looking at the, the recommendation it gives to you. Yes. Uh, in this sense, it's medium black box. Uh, yeah, no, no, like, like, it's what I'm saying. There's another interesting work here by people at EPFL about um, trying to understand uh, radicalization on YouTube. And they, they, like, it's a paper where they uh, suggest strongly at the end that the YouTube algorithm is recommending very, uh, like more, uh, more and more radicalized uh, videos yes. uh, to users. But the way they probed it was not through input output, uh, basic input output interaction with the algorithm. Okay. How Instead, they, what they looked is that the, at the user's comments to the, uh, to the different videos. And what they observed is that there was a, a pipeline, like people would be coming, like there were lots of users that would be commenting on videos that are more and more radicalized. Okay, so they can follow the sequence of videos that some user watched? Through the through comments that, that are posted. Yeah. Okay. And I guess this is a very indirect way mm -hmm. of probing the algorithm. Um, okay, I see. Yeah. So, mm, yeah. So there, there could be some confounding factors. For example, uh, something else in the world make people more radicalized, like Trump, let's say. And then they observe this on YouTube. But, yeah. Uh, so that's for sure, that's I don't know if they had uh, other uh, observations that indicates that it's the role of you, the, that is actually a consequence of the YouTube algorithm. Um, it's a good point, uh, for sure. Um, actually, at some point, we should probably invite Manuel <laughs> into the podcast. Yes, definitely. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a good point. Uh, so, like, another thing that they, they... I haven't read the paper yet, <laughs> I should, but uh, just skip through it. Uh, but uh, another point that uh, was made, I don't remember where, is that um, uh, the the... The, peop the, 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 uh, the videos themselves were not, like the, the YouTuber was not recommending more radicalized uh, videos. Uh, and so this suggests that the way people switched to more radicalized videos were, were through like non, uh, let, let's say non-human uh, recommendation uh, means. Like, not not direct say. human, like it was not the YouTuber who said, yeah, you should watch this guy. Was not like oh, okay, yeah, on, on yeah. the like on, on the well, I guess nobody is using this anymore. But like, I don't even know if it's still a thing. But back in the days, at least uh, on the the YouTube page of a, of a channel, uh, you could suggest uh, related uh, YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's it was related. like the, the 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 creator's choice. Yeah. So that would be like the creator recommending videos. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there is this anymore uh, still. I'm not sure. But, uh, I don't think any, any people, like, most people are probably not using it. Like most people just follow recommendation. Like 70% uh, of the views on YouTube are, are results of recommendation of the algorithm. And uh, what, what they suggest is that, well, it's not like uh, humans who are trying to push humans being to be more and more radicalized. It has to be something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you say, it can be something outside of YouTube. Uh, yeah, and uh, this kind of result also were found on other platforms like uh, Twitter. I think that the you people react more to uh, to more polarized comments, and uh, because this algorithm uses an objective function, uh, engagement and uh, reactions of people, uh, definitely it's a clear cut consequence that uh, if we recommend, if we want to maximize uh, engagement, we would show more polarized content. Yeah. Because this seems this is yeah uh, yeah yeah uh, uh, just, just to get back again to, to probing algorithm i think um i think that's really like uh, so i've read a lot of, of papers on polarization recently and uh, uh like many, many of the papers are, are, are trying to do some probing in the sense uh, of, of what's going on uh, maybe not of the algorithms itself but maybe of the, the whole ecosystem but sometimes of, of the algorithm itself and <laughs> Um, uh, and you know, like people like uh, Manuel or people like uh, uh, Joachim uh, Algeier or, or Guillaume Chasseau, I, I feel like they are all trying to use tricks, like and and, and that's pretty, pretty nice. But I, like I, I feel that maybe there's some overall arching theory to be made, uh, like how should you probe an algorithm overall, and to have something more like more principled. To give people ideas of how to do this, like the, the paper does it 
uh, quite a lot actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, it gives a lot of examples of how to do it. Uh, uh, but yeah, I feel like maybe there needs to be more more push in this direction. Yeah, I I see. But uh, okay, just a thought is that I'm a bit afraid that uh, what would be a, a theoretical result about this might uh, might not be useful in practice. So, yeah. for example, if you say uh, pick random points in the space of inputs, then we we don't know how to create that input for for using yeah. the computer system. We don't have a the the fact that we are forced to interact through the YouTube's API or YouTube uh, user interface to yeah. be able to probe the algorithm. We are very restricted in the way we can uh, we can probe these algorithms. Yeah, yeah. 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 Other discussion in the paper that uh, that were quite interesting was uh, on the side of the of the law. Yeah. And uh, so he describes examples where legally le- legally it was actually forbidden for someone and uh, people re- had a lot of trouble after working on probing some uh, some algorithms or some database to to know the data that's out there and uh, for, for example uh, i don't know if uh, if if we try to probe youtube's algorithm where will we uh, will we uh, get a lawsuit because we are trying to steal a Google's uh, secret uh, yeah. of the of the train, yeah. and uh, yeah, okay. And there is also the possibility that the the law forces that uh, algorithms could be more transparent, and uh, it it could be in some uh, specific fashion. I don't know if GDPR does it uh, does it ask for this kind of thing. Uh, so there's a claim about the transparency of how the data was were used, uh, but. Yeah, I feel like it's really subject to interpretation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, in, in practice, like... Uh, yeah, but is, isn't it at least able to ask for all the data about us? Um, so is, I'm not sure it's exactly that. Stored? It's more like how the data were used, something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to get some legal expert <laughs> yeah. to know more. Uh, yeah. Like we also talk about the, the case of uh, of the geisha API algorithm, um, which is an interesting example because, um, like, I don't really know how it was in the US, but <coughs> like it could be a fully transparent algorithm because uh, it's it's really nice algorithm. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's the algorithm used to assign uh, people to, uh, for instance, like students to uh, uh, universities. Yeah. Uh, students have different preferences. Universities may express also different uh, uh, preferences about the students, and then you have this matching algorithm that uh, also like has nice property and uh, it's like very transparent and it's like uh, it's like more than trans- like it has additional properties and just being transparent. Uh, namely, we can prove theorems about this. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that's pretty nice. Like you know that it's going to lead to a stable matching. You know also that uh, there are incentives for the different. For, for one side, uh, um, for the, the students, it's well designed to be truthful in what they're saying. Um, and yes. um, so, so, like, annoyingly, in France, when it was applied, uh, the code was not actually transparent. And uh, back when I was actually trying to, to, to probe this algorithm. <laughs> oh, you were? Okay. Uh, well, not probing, I could not, like, it was not even black box uh, to me. Uh, like, I could not interact. Well, it was like very black box to me because I could not. In- Cannot mm-hmm. give input and see outputs, um, and, and I could not have indirect information about this. Like I, I was, I, I was, uh, because I was preparing a video on this topic, and I was pretty sure it was using Geisha Play, but I could not verify it. Like, uh, like uh, okay. I, there yeah. was no resources that clearly stated we use Geisha Play algorithm. Okay, um, and there was this story about like the so the high school students were complaining about this, mm-hmm. and uh, at some point the. Or the government was just not releasing the code, and at some point they they sent the code to the to the high school uh, high school uh, as, uh, student association, and they sent it by e- by mail, by physical by mail. By post, okay. Yeah. Uh, and the code was horrible; like there was a uh, was very bad code. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I think it's the case, but it's really like a, a shame. Like you could have a very nice transparent algorithm well designed and uh, certified by different experts i don't know but yeah maybe there's not enough of a reflex to to 
to, to try to make code uh, transparent in, in general. Um, for sure, in many companies, because uh, but uh, uh, also in governments. Um, yeah, yeah more, well, the open source movement is, is growing, I guess. But yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, for this kind of question, I'm still worried about a, a general understanding of uh, what the algorithm would do. I, I don't think uh, I don't think it's uh, the reach of a large proportion of the population to understand a. Some uh, stable matching algorithm on graphs. Yeah. So uh, I think it's a completely different question how it would be perceived uh, and whether the situation where humans look at the rankings and uh, decide, oh, these algorithms that a lot of people won't understand. So, uh, so I guess most uh, of it is uh, indirect probing, I guess, like you just ask an expert's uh, opinion and if enough experts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That seem independent enough and uh, say it's good. Well, you start to trust it. Um, yeah, I guess trust is works on like you don't trust directly the algorithm. Yeah, it's interesting. I point the intermediaries probing algorithms for building trust. It's yeah. a it's a good uh, good point. In the... Yeah, yeah. And so it, yeah, the only yeah, right. I guess the the. Because the, the the paper po- talks mostly about probing algorithms through direct m- means, like interacting or analyzing the outputs of the algorithms. Mm-hmm. But there are also like important indirect means to probing algorithms, um, like especially if you don't want to spend time or you're not skilled enough to understand an algorithm. Uh, yes, you can ask people who may know better and and. You, yeah, there's also the, the, the question of trust in experts uh, at some point, but yeah. Okay, cool. Well, right. thanks for watching and I hope you'll be here. Next time we're going to talk about, uh, we should be talking about uh, uh, robustness in high dimensional, uh, high, high dimensional statistics and a series of recent papers uh, about this, which is a, a very interesting and important topic for resilience to attacks, uh, adversarial attacks.